We good? All right, welcome to Sunday Evening Worship. I'm so glad y'all are here tonight to celebrate the Cincinnati Bengals' amazing playoff win. First time in 30 years last night. I wouldn't have worn this this morning, but maybe I would have. I don't know. But I had a, I had a nice outfit pick for this morning. But uh, I just wanted to come in, and this is hot, and now it's stuck around this thing. Hold on. All right, now. Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Tom, you mind praying for us? Amen. Thank you, Tommy. All right, so we are going to sing Blessed Be the Name. It's going to be 310 in your hymn books. Blessed Be the Name. Thank you, Ann. Outstanding as usual. All right, so I first want to point attention to the flowers. These are in memory of Miss Maline, and I believe it's for her birthday. So these flowers, uh, Richard put them in here. Let me get this out of the way. I want to make sure everybody sees them. They are nice and beautiful, uh, but they are in memory of Miss Maline for her birthday. So uh, thank you, Richard, for putting them in here for us to look at them and remember uh, what I've heard is an amazing woman and a woman of God and meant a lot to this church. So we have deacons meeting this Tuesday, um, the 18th at 7 o'clock here, and then our business meeting. So we will not be live 
uh, Wednesday, which is more mainly for the online folks, but we'll have business meeting uh, this Wednesday, the 19th at 7 o'clock. And then Awana's supposed to start back up tonight. And then as we, I got to the bridge, uh, Carrie Ann texted me, Jay's not feeling good, so she wasn't able to make it either. So <laughs> I had already texted Amy, and her and the kids were on the way. So Amy's stuck with all the kids down there. So And I brought the whole group. Um, so pray for Amy while we're in here. But Awana starts back tonight, uh, but it will be back full-fledged uh, next Sunday, Lord willing. We have birthdays. You know, sometimes I get this right, and sometimes I mess it up. But we had uh, Greg Floyd's birthday was on Wednesday, the 12th, and Miss Ann's birthday was yesterday, Saturday. So, Charlie, what did you do? Oh, nice. All right. You'll get a pass. <laughs> and then that's it for the birthdays last week. Is there any birthdays I'm missing? Anybody knows about? All right. So I believe that's it. Are there any other announcements that I'm not thinking about that I'm forgetting? All right. So this evening, if you have your Bibles, if you will please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we are going to look at the first 12 verses. Now, I understand that if you look at the totality of the 12 verses, Paul is mainly talking about sexual sin, which is what the church in Thessalonica struggled with. So we're not going to focus on that so much um, as we are going to focus a little bit at the bottom on some of the stuff that he talks about living a life pleasing to God. And when we talk about you know the sexual sins, the Greek word uses pornea, which is where we get uh, pornography, um, but that's a lot about self-control. And so that's where the focus is going to be for this message. There's so many different ways um, you can take this and apply this to your life. There's so many different ways that you can take this and, and view it. Um, but the way that we're going to tonight is living a life pleasing to God, which is what the section says in my Bible. I didn't come up with that on my own. Um, but, you know, these, I believe, let me, let me verify, I have five ways that Paul is talking about in here that we can live a life or that we that will help us live a life pleasing to God. So if everybody's turned their Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we'll start reading in verse 1. And Paul writes, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgresses and wrongs his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God. Who gives his Holy Spirit to you? Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before ourselves out, or excuse me may so you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one so again paul writes these things when paul writes his letters they're for a purpose they're to a specific church dealing with certain issues and obviously Thessalonica had quite a few if you couldn't uh, tell from that so the first thing that we see that pops out at us in this scripture is that uh, to live a life pleasing to God is we must have self-control. We must have self-control. We cannot give in to our sins. We cannot allow sin to rule our lives. Once we become Christ followers, we are covered in his blood. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit, as we talked about this morning. So we are no longer slaves to our sin. But here's the beauty of it. This self-control is not ours. 
This self-control is not ours. If you read 2 Timothy 1.7, it tells us exactly where this self-control come from, comes from. And it says, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So if you're a believer this morning, or this morning, wow. If you're a believer this evening, it's the first time we were able to be in church together today. But if you're a believer this evening, then you have self-control. By being a child of God, you have self-control. And it's the type of self-control that Paul is telling the, the church at Thessalonica that they needed to have. Because they had issues with doing certain things. And it's not just, you know, that word pornea means so much more than just prostitution or adultery. There's so many different things that fall underneath that umbrella. But we are to have self-control for it to live a life that is pleasing to God. Now, I do want to point out that that verse in 2 Timothy 1.7 was written to Timothy. Um, and when it talked about the fear, I, I think this is important. Uh, Timothy lacked something. Timothy maybe didn't feel as confident. Um, but the word cowardice that's used uh, in this verse talks about lack of moral strength. Lack of moral strength. And so that's what the children of the, the, of the church in Thessalonica or the Thessalonians, that's what they had. They had a lack of moral strength. They could not say no. They could not get out of their sin. They could not get, maybe get out of their own way, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I've met plenty of folks who go to a revival or, or, or um, you know, go to a church service because they've been invited because somebody, somebody's kids singing or somebody in their family's getting baptized and they come forward and they get saved. And then you don't see them darken the church's doors again. They're not being taught. They're not being discipled. They're not following what God has commanded them to do. So then, you know, my next question would be, were they truly saved, right? That's not for me to judge. But, you know, those types of things do happen. So God gives us the self-control that we need. Again, if you haven't noticed, to be a Christ follower, to live a life that's pleasing to God, to, to live a way that... The world cannot say that we are anything but his. We have to rely on God for everything. There is nothing in a Christian's life that requires us to be able to do it. Everybody understands that? I mean, sure, we can have self-control sometimes. Yeah, you put a German chocolate cake in front of me, there might be a day where I could walk by it and not eat the whole thing. But 99% of the time, I'm going to eat the whole stinking thing, right? So um, self-control, the first thing that we need to do is have self-control to live a life that is pleasing to God. Then the second thing, if you notice, was brotherly love. Now the church in Thessalonica, Paul says they're doing a good job. They're loving the brothers all over Macedonia. Now this, this brotherly love, the word is Philadelphia. Everybody knows that, the city, or the Philadelphia, the city where everybody loves to stab you, right? I don't know if you guys have heard that one before. Anyway, if you're from Philadelphia, I apologize. Um, not really. But this brotherly love that, is, that Paul is talking about, this used to be or what's described as the love that blood relatives had for each other. And so what happened is the church grew in the New Testament. They took that word that meant um, the love that blood relatives had for each other, and they turned it into the family of God. And so, and you guys get that, right? A blood relative. Now, I'm telling you, I have seen some pretty crappy blood relatives in people's lives, but they will not turn their back on them. It doesn't matter what they do to them. They'll continue bailing them out of jail. They'll continue. You get what I'm saying? So that's the type of love that we should have for one another, for fellow Christians. The love should not be conditional. The love should be like we are in the same family, which we are. We're all children of God. So the second thing to live a life pleasing to God is to have brotherly love, to have love for one another. And we know that the greatest commandment, uh, as Jesus told us, is to love. Is to love. And so this, it, it, I think that's why, not, I don't think, but I, I know that's why Paul glossed over. One, they were good at it, and two, he says, God has already told you. God's already told you. Love, love one another. So um, the third one, which I, I find uh, unique, is live quietly. Live quietly. Here's why I find this unique. Because what happened is when the church in, when the church at Thessalonica, when folks started coming to know Jesus Christ, they quit doing anything and everything that they were doing previous to becoming Christians, which included worshiping and serving at whatever God or whatever church, for lack of a better term, that they lived in, so or they worked in. So what happened was the church at Thessalonica had already created such a, a, um, such an uproar, had, had knocked things off its axis, if you will, 
that Paul didn't want them out there making things worse. Now, what does this mean? Was Paul telling them not to go share the gospel? No. This, to me, is where you start talking about beating people over the head with a gospel stick. Standing outside in an abortion clinic, we know abortion's wrong, we know abortion's a sin, and we'll scream that at the top of our lungs, but maybe instead of standing in front of an abortion clinic, we, we um, volunteer at a pregnancy center and talk to these young girls as they come out of having an abortion and, and realize it was the wrong thing, or the ones that want to keep their baby, and we stand next to them. But this live quietly, it, it's to me, you know, and you can interpret it however you want, but we are to be bold, we are, be to de- we are to be decisive, but we're not supposed to be like this world. And what's this world like? We saw it on January 6th. I'm just going to tell you, we saw it on January 6th. Regardless of how the election went, regardless if the election was stolen, we should not have been acting the way we were acting at the Capitol on January 6th. You don't fight wrongs with wrongs, right? My, my mama used to tell me two lefts don't make a right. Two wrongs don't make a right. Whatever I've, she said, but we are to live quietly. Again, that does not mean that we are not to live for God. That does not mean we're not supposed to go out and share the gospel. What that means is we're not supposed to be out and about trying to stab people and tell them that they're living a life of sin and they're going to hell. There's got to be some balance, right? And if we're bouncing all over the wall and, and constantly going out there, uh, the for instance, the pregnancy center that I'm on, uh, the, com- the committee, council, whatever it's called, in Sumter, one year they participated in the um, pro-life rally that they had in Sumter. It was up and down 378 near the businesses, some of the churches. And the director of, of said was outside of said uh, pregnancy center was outside tractor supply. And this was the first and only year they've ever been a part of the pro-life um, deal downtown Sumter, or down in Sumter. And what she heard, and these folks were standing in front of their church, was just the most vile, inhumane things that you could say to people. I get it. Abortion is sin. But where's the love? You're not going to turn somebody around from their decision by screaming at them. Matter of fact, they were so ugly that a car stopped and confronted them. Now, does that sound Christ-like to you? I'm all for a good fight. I'm all for a good fight, but if it takes away from the message, if it takes away from what what God is doing in our lives, then we just need to be quiet. We need to live a little bit more quietly. Again, we rail against the system. We're going to stand up. We're going to call sin, sin. We're going to pray for people. If we see somebody living in sin, our brother, sister in Christ, we're supposed to in here, we're supposed to hold them accountable. You tell them to their face what they're doing wrong. But we're to live quietly, as he tells the church in Thessalonica, especially when you already have them uh, up in arms. And then I pulled up a verse from 1 Peter 3, 4. It says, but let your adorning be hidden, be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle, quiet spirit, which is in God's sight is very precious. So we'll focus on that gentle and quiet spirit. But what Paul was saying here in this, this first Peter, because I want to make sure we don't take anything out of context, is Paul is elevating inner beauty above external appearance. Paul is elevating inner beauty above external experience. Well, part, uh, appearance, a part of that inner beauty is a gentle and quiet spirit. I, I don't know about you, but um, I had bosses who would scream at you every time you messed up. And then I had bosses that would just look at you and walk away. Which ones do you think I worried about the most? The guy that just looked at me and walked away. They didn't rant and holler and threaten to throw me out the fire station or threaten to slam me up against the wall. It was a quiet and gentle spirit because that person was never mad. And I know they're mad now and I'm the one that caused it. But gentle and quiet spirit. And the number four is we mind our own business. Mind one's business, right? That, that seems uh, easy to do, seems easy to say. But the church at Thessalonica actually... Um, if you read, they, they were involved in all sorts of drama. They were in everybody's business. They knew who was going where and what they were doing and how they were doing it, and they made sure that so did their neighbor and so did the other folks in the church. They were in everybody's business. 
So I wonder how many people that weren't part of the church in Thessalonica, the body in Thessalonica, I wonder how many of them that they had gossiped about, that they had inserted them into their affairs. I wonder how many of them wanted to join that church. I wonder how many of them wanted to become Christ followers because, you know, they modeled it so well. I wonder how many people they turned away because of that. And in Philippians 4, 8, it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So if we are so busy worrying about what everybody else is doing, are we focused on ourselves? Are we focused on our relationship with Jesus Christ? Are we focused on our sins and how it may be affecting our fellow brothers and sisters? See, a lot of times that's what we do, right? Because I, if I focus on my sin, that means I have to admit that I'm sinning or I'm a sinner or I'm wrong. So it's easier for me to look at uh, David, because I always pick on him, and say, well, David does this. He's way worse off than I am. Oh, hey, Kenneth, by the way, did you know David did this? Right? I mean, I'm not, uh, nobody's focused on me anymore. You know, the good bait and switch. I, I've seen it happen. Go to chew somebody out, and then all of a sudden you hear about what's going on over here, especially when I was a first sergeant. Go uh, take somebody into OSI for a drug bust. You think they're getting arrested. Well, next thing you, know, you get a call to pick them up because guess what they just did? They just narked on everybody <laughs> that they had been doing it with. So anyway, we're, we're called to mind one's business, to live a life pleasing to God. We have to be focused on us and our relationship with him. If we focus on that, if we're kingdom-minded, if, if our focus is on the kingdom, everything else will take care of itself. It's not our responsibility to, to figure out who's in church and who's not in church. What it is is our responsibility to call and check on them and say, hey, are you okay? I had not seen you in a couple weeks. Just want you to know we miss you. It's our responsibility to go out and share the gospel and invite people to church. And they remember the other things. Hopefully we've done the other things well so that we're living a life pleasing to God, that people want to come and be a part of this church and be a part of this body. Because if we're not, and I'm telling you, it just takes one of us, if one of us is out in this community or out somewhere and acting a fool, we're all labeled that. That's how we all are. I promise you that. That's how the world looks at things. When I was in the military, we had a young man who uh, decided to uh, abuse his two-year-old stepson and ended up the young man became deceased. Well, after that, the guy that did it was a cop, believe it or not. Well, after he did that, we had to tell the cops not to wear their uniforms in and out of the base. If they had their beret, which they wore berets, you know, because it looks cool. If they had their beret, like, sitting on their dash, put it away. Get changed at work. Because to the, to the local community, because, of course, the wife, who was the mother of the son, was a local girl. But to the local community, it was open season on all cops. Because all security forces members at Mountain Home Air Force Base were like that one individual. So it's the same thing for church. If one of us is out there acting a fool, that's how we all act. Because, oh, guess what, by the way, we know they do that. This is what they're thinking, and we allow that to happen. We allow that to happen. But we need to mind our own business. We need to keep our mind on whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is poor. Everything that's talked about Philippians 4, 8, if we kept our mind on those things, we wouldn't have time, nor would we care what was going on in anybody else's life or what they were doing. Now, again, there is discipline there's church discipline, there's spiritual discipline, there's ways we can step into that. But we have to be very careful to make sure that when we do, it is very discreet. So we're not standing up in front of the church, pounding our chest, saying, yeah, so I called so-and-so on the carpet. Right? I mean, I like to look tough too, but it's not how we're supposed to do it. And then finally in fifth, Paul talks about working hard. So the there's, there's a couple of... Uh, things that's going on in the church of Thessalonica. Um, one of them is that uh, folks relied on the, the church to take care of them, so they quit working. So Paul is telling them, hey, don't quit working. Work hard. Use your hands. Do what we have taught you to do. And this comes from the book of Proverbs, right? There's so many that talks about being lazy is a sin, um, uh, you know, all that stuff. Uh, 
Martin, I know you don't have any problem with this one, but Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica, keep working and make sure you're working hard because you're an example. It, it doesn't matter if you work at a, at a mill or if you work at an auto hobby shop or if you work at a church. You're supposed to do it all for the glory of God. But Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. See, if everything that we do, no matter if it's in a church setting or outside of the church, if we commit our work and what we do to God, he's going to, he's going to establish our plans. Our plans will be established. It will be taken care of for us. God expects us to be workers. God expects us to be out in the field. God expects us, because remember, there's two things we got to do, right? We got to sow the seeds, and then as a body, we have to be ready to harvest once God grows and makes the increase. We have to be ready to harvest. Those aren't easy, right? Especially if someone that has been just a pain in the neck for some of you in here all these years you've lived here in Turbeville walks through that door and wants, and wants to become a, a Christ follower. That's tough, right? Sorry, I had popcorn. But we're supposed to work hard. We're not supposed to shirk our duties. We're not supposed to shirk our responsibilities. Whatever God tells us that we're supposed to do, we need to do it. And that's essentially what Paul is saying. Now, I had a, a buddy of mine who's actually a mentor. We were talking one time. He was in Honduras with me uh, for the two, two trips I went previously. And he, he had a little sermon and there are a couple of things that I want to share from his message, and it's not word for word, but that I thought were very poignant and mean, mean something to what we're talking about tonight. So, you know, what he put is, as recipients of God's generosity, we are to live within the boundaries of his gospel. Now, what are God's generosities? Salvation, mercy, grace. You got food in your cupboards. You got a vehicle to drive, you got money in the bank, or even if you got a couple bucks in your pocket, um, you know the list can go on. But God um, gives us generosity, and so that means we're supposed to live uh, within the boundaries of His gospel, which will help us live a, cr a life that is worthy. We know that there's an acceptable way to live. A corporate command with individual implications. What your church cannot live worthy of the gospel unless you are living worthy. What what he meant there, what what he talked about there, again, is we are a team. Whether you whether you like me or not, whether you like the person that's sitting to your right or left, you are part of First Baptist Church Turbeville. So if one person's not living right, we're all not living right. We're all not living right. So one person can affect the whole body and how we uh, live for God and how our church is viewed. And so the final thing I want to say is God has given his spirit to equip us, the saints, for service. And that's in Romans chapter 12, verse 3 through 8, and I'm not going to, but you have a gift to use. You are not living a life worthy of God, if you are not using your God-given gift to glorify him. Uh, plain and simple. If you have a lot of connections, if you can speak clearly, if you could not stumble, fumble, and mumble over words and forget whole points and messages, if you have the gift to be able to orate, you should be out there sharing the gospel. If you have the gift of knitting, you know, in Sumter, there's this uh, knitting club when I, my previous job um, it's called, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a knitting club, and so it was underneath my ministry area. Now, these ladies, they're a little bit older, and they're not necessarily out there sharing the gospel, but what I'll tell you is every blanket that a new mother gets in Toomey, they get the gospel. That's a gift that they have, and they're able to share the gospel through their gift, and there's so many different gifting areas. There's so many different things that we are good at. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes what we do is we're like Moses, and we look in the mirror and say, God, I'm not cut out for this, or God, you don't want me doing this. Well, guess what? That's what God ex wants you to exactly do. That's exactly what God wants you to do. But it's too hard. 
It's too hard. So I pray tonight that we take our gifts and that we use them for the glory of God and that we live a life pleasing to God through self-control, brotherly love, living quietly, minding our own business, and working hard. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you tonight so thankful that you give us clear instructions. You show us exactly what we're supposed to do through the writings of your apostles and prophets. And God, just thank you for laying out the map of how we're supposed to live and what is pleasing to you and what is displeasing to you. We're not out here just blindly walking this earth saying, well, I hope God was okay with that, or I hope this was okay, and I hope nobody thinks bad about this. We know sin is sin. We know where our boundaries are. God, help us to live within those boundaries. And if I am living outside those boundaries, I pray that you show it to me so that I can get back within your boundaries. And God, I pray that you be with us the rest of this service as we get ready to list names and, and pray for those that are sick, those that are healing, those that are dealing with loss of loved ones. And God, just be with us the rest of this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So I wrote the prayer requests down at home and left them. But I have this. Is there? I'm going to add them to this. But other than this, what, what was some of the names this morning or somebody you need to add tonight any prayer requests okay carol's procedures wednesday her for her heart, so pray for her. Harriet Welch, heart issues. She got AFib, I take it. All right. Any others? Alex and Mary. Um, Pray for Megan. I got a text from Jay that she's sick. I saw on Facebook she put strep throat, which supposedly got it from some kids. Um, and then tonight, like I said, as I was coming up, Carrie Ann sent me a text that she wasn't going to be here because Jay's sick. So pray for them. Continue to pray for Mr. Bruce. Um, I got a text I think it was yesterday, yeah, it was yesterday, and it was a picture of him, and he was more clear, still having trouble understanding some of the stuff, but while Anna was there, he made sure he told Anna that Donna only works Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, and what hours at the church, and that I was here yesterday, or I mean, it was Friday, and that I was here Friday, but Donna only worked those days, so I, I don't know how that conversation went, I don't know how it even started, but she said Mr. Bruce made sure that she knew when, who was here and when, so... He's definitely got the church on his mind, and uh, but continue to pray for him and that he can get healed up and get out of that hospital sooner rather than later. Margie at her physical therapy last week um, was able to stand up and hold herself up. And she's still got a long way to go, but that is a huge improvement. So continue to pray for Margie as she's going through her um, healing process as well. Reverend Creech, again, as I said this morning, no symptoms, but he is COVID positive in isolation, so family can't go visit him. Uh, Danny Godwin's doing good. The uh, Will Thigpen and Anna Thigpen, they all have uh, COVID, and I believe the baby's got it too. Don't, don't quote me, um, but I know that it's in their house. Matter of fact, he does because uh, Rhonda sent me a text this morning and said that they said the baby was doing better but then had a slight fever. Um, and then uh, Anna's parents have COVID as well. So pray for them. So Rhonda and William are isolated over in their world. So far, no symptoms, so they haven't went and got tested. Uh, they are vaccinated, but uh, so just pray for that family as well as the COVID virus is running through them also. Any 
Anybody else? Anything else? All right, any praises? Did anybody lose electricity today? Here? Yeah, while you and I were talking early this morning about it, I was already, I was looking at Facebook trying to find something that was going to talk about what was going to happen. There ain't nothing more frustrating than trying to make a good decision with a lack of information. So, anyway. Um, but there was a lot of folks in Sumter that were without power. Um, my dad and stepmom, they got their power back about three something this afternoon. Uh, but they had been out since six this morning. That was in Kershaw County. So, but yes. All right. David, you mind closing us out with a word of prayer?